Shall we pray? Our loving Heavenly Father, as we look at the world, everything appears to be spinning out of control. But we know that you're seated on your throne in heaven beyond the noise and the hustle and bustle of earth. Nothing escapes your attention. You have everything under perfect control. We thank you that we can trust you as such a wonderful God. And as we uh, study the second part of the prophecy of Daniel 8, we plead for the help of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to understand, not only intellectually, but also experientially. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that we want to do in our study today is review what we studied last time. Last time we were discussing Daniel chapter 8. And I'm going to go through this rather quickly because we have a lot of material to cover in our lecture today. You remember that in Daniel chapter 8, the vision begins with a ram. And then after the ram, we find that, well, in connection with the ram rather, we have two what? Two horns. And one of them is higher than the other. When does the higher one come out, first or last? The higher one comes out last. Now, what is represented by the ram? The kingdom of Medo-Persia. What do the two horns represent? They represent the fact that it's a dual kingdom. And Persia was the predominant kingdom that rose to power last, as we studied. And then we have a flying he-goat. What does the he-goat represent? It represents the kingdom of Greece. And the he-goat has a notable horn between its eyes. What does the notable horn represent? The notable horn represents the first king, and the first king was whom? Alexander the Great. And then when the kingdom was strong, the great horn was broken. And how many horns came out in its place? Four horns came out in its place. And those four horns represent the four divisions of what? Of Greece, of Alexander's empire. And then from one of the horns at the four winds, a little horn rises. And we notice that it rises from Pergamum in Asia Minor. And then this little horn, first of all, conquers how? Horizontally. His conquests are earthly. But then this little horn has a second stage. Now its fight is not against any kingdom on earth. Its fight is against whom? It's against the God of heaven. And we notice that this little horn attacked the host, which represents God's people. And we notice that he also attacked the prince of the host. And who is the prince of the host? The prince of the host is Jesus Christ. And he took away what? The daily from Christ, with, which means the work of Jesus in the court and in the holy place of the sanctuary. And then we noticed in Daniel 8 that the video goes blank. And there's a conversation between two heavenly beings. And one heavenly being asks the other, until when will this vision last? It's the vision of the ram, the goat, and the two stages of the little horn. Until when or how long will this vision last? And the other one says to this being, unto 2,300 days and the sanctuary shall be what? Shall be cleansed. And then we noticed that Gabriel went on to explain the meaning of the shazun, of the vision. Did he explain what the ram represents? Yes, he did. Did he explain what the two horns represent? Absolutely. Did he explain what the flying he goat represents? Yes. Did he explain what the notable horn is? Absolutely. Did he explain what the four horns are in the second half of the chapter? Absolutely. Did he explain the horizontal conquest of the little horn? Yes. Did he explain the vertical attack of the little horn upon God? Absolutely. But the interesting thing is that when uh, Gabriel got to the part 
that had to do with the 2300 days or the appearance of the two beings that were talking in heaven, he had to suspend the explanation of the vision. He did not finish the explanation of the vision. And so we notice that God tells Gabriel, uh, Gabriel, explain the mare, which is the other word for vision. The first word is the one that's used at the beginning of the chapter. Explain the mare, which is the appearance of the two beings. And Gabriel could not do it because he, uh, Daniel, according to scripture, got sick. Let's read that in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 27. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 27 tells us that Daniel did not understand the moray. Now he understood the shazon, which is the total vision, because Gabriel explained it. But the portion that he did not understand was the other word for vision that is used uh, in the middle of chapter 8. Notice what it says in Daniel 8 verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision. The word vision there is not the chazon. It's not what Gabriel had explained. It's the word mare. In other words, Daniel could not understand the conversation of these two beings concerning the time period, the 2300 days. And so it says, uh, I was astonished by the vision, by the moray, but no one, what? Understood it. So which portion of the vision did Daniel not understand? He understood the shazon, the whole vision that includes the ram, the he goat, the horns, the little horn and its two stages, etc. But he did not understand the moray. Now let's give a little bit of historical background. If you remember, Daniel chapter 8 is taking place in the year 550 BC. And we're told there in Daniel chapter 8 that after 2,300 days, the sanctuary would be cleansed. But we have a problem in Daniel chapter 8. Is there any beginning date for the 2,300 days? Is there anything in Daniel 8 that says when the 2300 days were going to begin? Absolutely not. So would it be important to know when the 2300 days are going to begin so that we could know when the 2300 days are going to end? Absolutely. But in Daniel 8, you don't have an explanation of the 2300 days. They're brought to view, but you don't have an explanation. And you have absolutely no beginning date. Now the question is, where would you expect to find the explanation of the beginning date of the prophecy of the 2300 days? The next chapter would be a very good place to look. Now, let's go forward to the year 538. This is the date for Daniel 9. Okay, Daniel 8 is 550 BC. Remember that before Christ we go down, right? Daniel chapter 9 is taking place in 538 B.C. Babylon has just fallen the year before. Now, Daniel knew that there was a prophecy that God had given that the captivity of Israel in Babylon was going to last 70 years. He knew that. In fact, let's read that prophecy as we find it in 2 Chronicles 36 and verses 15 through 21. And I'm going to read also uh, the events that led up to the captivity of Israel. And this is a long passage, but I'm going to read it because it's important. It says here, And the Lord God of their fathers, that is of Israel, sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who was Nebuchadnezzar, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. 
And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his, his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. Verse 20, And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons, until when? until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. Now notice, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill how long? To fulfill 70 years. So how long was Israel going to remain in captivity in Babylon? According to Jeremiah, they were going to be there 70 years. But now listen, Daniel chapter 9 is taking place in 538 B.C. Now Daniel knew when the 70-year captivity began. It actually began in the year 605 B.C. And Daniel knew from personal experience because Nebuchadnezzar took him and his three friends to Babylon in the year 605 B.C. And so if you go from 605 B.C. forward for a period of 70 years, you come to the year 536 B.C., and Daniel 9 is taking place in 538. And Daniel doesn't see anything happening. He's saying, you know, God promised that in, that in 70 years, a decree was going to be given for us to go back to our land to rebuild the city, rebuild the temple, rebuild the walls. Here we are, 538, two more years, and the 70 years are over, and I don't see anything happening. And so he's very, very concerned. And so Daniel decides to take another look at the prophecy of the 70 years of Jeremiah. Notice Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Daniel 9, 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So what was Daniel studying as Daniel chapter 9 begins? He was studying the prophecy of the 70-year captivity because the 70-year captivity is about to end. Now it appears that Daniel was not able to reconcile the 70-year prophecy of Jeremiah with the prophecy of the 2300 days, which, by the way, are years, applying the year-day principle. In other words, Daniel says, God has said that our sanctuary and our city will be desolate and trampled upon for 70 years, but now I remember that 11 years ago, God said that the sanctuary would be trampled and the city would be trampled for 2300 years. So Daniel is trying to figure out how to reconcile the 70-year prophecy with the 2300-day or year prophecy. And suddenly a thought comes to the mind of Daniel. Daniel says to himself, is it perhaps possible that God has decided because of the rebellion of his people, because they've been so disobedient to him, that God has decided not to fulfill his word and end the captivity after 70 years, but he has decided to extend it for 2,300 years. Are you understanding the problem that Daniel has? Is it just possible? And so Daniel now raises to God one of the most beautiful intercessory prayers that we find in all of the Bible. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 4 through 11a. And I'm going to read these verses because we need to catch the context of what we're looking at. Daniel chapter 9, verse 4, and we're going to go through verse 11, the first part of the verse. This is where Daniel confesses his sin and the sin of his people. Because he, he says, God has said 70 years the city and the sanctuary are going to be trampled upon, but then he said 2,300 years, and then the sanctuary is going to be cleansed, and it's going to be trampled upon. How do I understand the relationship between these two time periods? And so he confesses his sin and that of his people. Notice Daniel 9, verse 4. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, 
who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned. Notice he's confessing. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, to our fathers, and all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, those near and those far off, in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes, and our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. What is Daniel doing? He's confessing his sin and the sin of his people. With no excuses, no ifs, buts, or maybes, he's saying, we have sinned against you and we confess our sin. And then in Daniel 9, verse 11, the last half of the verse, through verse 14, Daniel describes the results of the disobedience of Israel. What is the fruit of their disobedience? Notice what he continues saying. Therefore, that is because we have rebelled, because we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, this is Deuteronomy 28, you need to write there because that's where the covenant curses are described. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, a servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us, bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the, this disaster in mind and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. So notice now he's talking about the results or fruits of the disobedience of Israel. Disaster has come upon Israel. The curse has fallen upon them. And then in chapter 9 and verses 15 through 19, Daniel now intercedes for his people. So you have, first of all, confession. Secondly, you have what? The results of the rebellion. And in the third place, now Daniel intercedes before the Lord is going to say, Lord, please have mercy. Let's read Daniel 9, beginning with verse 4, 15. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day. We have sinned, we have done wickedly. O oh Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Do you notice that he's praying for the city and he's praying for the sanctuary and he's praying for the people? Are those the same issues that were addressed in Daniel chapter 8? Absolutely. During the 2300 days, the sanctuary would be trampled upon, God's people would be trampled upon, and the prince of the host would be trampled upon. So now he's bringing to view all of these issues of Daniel chapter 8 because he doesn't understand how the 70 years relate to the 2300 days. Verse 18. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name for we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great what? Of your great mercies. 
So he has confessed his sin and the sin of Israel. He's spoken about the results of the sin, and now he's interceding before the Lord to pour out his mercy upon his people. And then we come to verse 19. This is a very important verse because it tells us what Daniel was worried about. Verse 19, there's a very important little word that's used here. This is the climax of his prayer. It's the last verse that has to do with his prayer. Notice, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. And now notice, do not what? What is Daniel's concern? That God is going to what? Delay his fulfillment of the prophecy of the 70 years. He says, do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people who are called by your name. That word delay is translated in the Old Testament, defer, to tarry, or to delay. Daniel is saying, Lord, do not delay the fulfillment of the prophecy of the 70 years. I know that your people have been sinners, but Lord, please forgive. And please don't extend this period to 2,300 years. That is Daniel's concern. And so then Daniel ends his prayer. And when Daniel ends his prayer, Gabriel is sent to Daniel with the answer to his prayer. Now, before we study the answer to Daniel's prayer, I'd like to ask this question. Is there any vision so far in Daniel chapter 9? Is there any vision? Is there any appearance of heavenly beings speaking in Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 19? None whatsoever. There is no vision. There is no heavenly being speaking. What do we have in the first part of Daniel 9? We have only a what? Only a prayer. That's an important detail. Now go with me to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 20, where Daniel's prayer is going to be answered. Here it says, Now while I was speaking, Daniel's still talking here, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God. Now notice what he's praying for. For what? For the holy mountain. What was on the holy mountain? On Mount Zion was the temple of Jerusalem. Okay? And so he says, Now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, now listen carefully, the man Gabriel, who was the one that appeared to Daniel in chapter 8? Gabriel. Is it the same angel? Absolutely. It says, that, that man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, that word vision is the word shazon, the very word that is used in Daniel chapter 9 to refer to, to the vision of the ram, the he-goat, the notable horn, the four horns, the little horn, etc. So he says, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, or the shazon at the beginning. Which vision at the beginning? Any vision in Daniel 9? No. So what vision must it be? It must be that he's coming back to explain the vision from what? Daniel 8 because the same word is used, the word shazon. So it's the same angel, and it says that I had seen him in the vision at the beginning, a direct reference to the previous chapter. He continues saying, verse 21, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. To understand what? Is there anything that needed to be understood in verses 1 through 19? No, there's no new vision. There's no new dream. What does Daniel need to understand? Does he need to understand the ram? No. Does he need to understand the goat? No. Does he need to understand the notable horn? 
No. Does he need to understand the four horns? No. Does he need to understand the little horn in its geographical and religious extension? Absolutely not. That has already been what? Explained in chapter 8. What is the part that he did not understand? The 2300-day prophecy. Notice what it continues saying in verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Interesting. And it continues saying in verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. In other words, God gave Gabriel the command. And I have come to what? I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, now listen carefully, therefore consider the matter and understand the mare. What is the part that Daniel had not understood? Did he understand the chazon? Yes. What is the part he did not understand? The mare. And so it says here, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Understand the mare. Now, what I want you to do is take out that sheet that we distributed, and I'm going to go through a summary of the whole thing, chapter 8 and chapter 9, so you have this crystal clear in your minds. We'll go first of all to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 15. After Gabriel has given this vision to Daniel, I want you to notice how Daniel reacts. Daniel 8 verse 15. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, that is the word Shazom, and was seeking the what? Did Daniel understand the Shazom? Not before the interpretation, because the interpretation in verse 15 has not been given yet. And so it says that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a what? Of a man. By the way, that's Gabriel. Now let's go on to verses 16 and 17. Gabriel is commanded to explain this to Daniel. Notice verse 16. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Now that word vision is the word mare. Why would it say, make this man understand the mare? Well, that's the focus that needs to be explained. But what does Gabriel have to do in order to be able to explain the mare? He has to explain what? He has to explain the shazon, everything that comes before that leads up to the mare. Are you understanding me or not? And so what is the part that God commands Gabriel to explain to Daniel? He says, explain the mare. But in order to explain the mare, he first of all has to explain what? The shazon, because the mare is the culmination of the Shazon. And so it says, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the Mare. So he came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid and fell on my face, but he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. And then what does Gabriel do? Gabriel begins explaining what? The Shazon. He explains the ram, the he-goat, the notable horn, the four horns, the little horn in its political extension, the little horn in its religious extension, how he tramples on the host, and how he also uh, attacks the ministry of the prince of the host. And then what does he want to explain? He wants to explain the moray. But what happens with Daniel? Daniel got sick. Let's read Daniel chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. It says in the vision, by the way, that's the word mare, of the evenings and mornings. Now we know that the mare refers to the evenings and mornings, right? The 2300-day prophecy. And the mare of the evenings and mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, what happened to him? You can understand the confusion. 70 years, now God says 2,300 years. Daniel is puzzled. He says, I don't, I, I don't get this. And so it says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, that is, by the mare, but no one what? 
understood. Interesting. Had, had uh, the Shazon already been explained? Yes. So what is the part that he doesn't understand? The part concerning the evenings and mornings that says so here, and the vision or the mare of the evenings and mornings, which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the mare, but no one understood. Let me ask you, had Gabriel completed his mission? No, because God had told Gabriel, explain to Daniel what? The mare. What is the only thing that Gabriel had explained? The Shazon. So did he need to complete his mission? He absolutely needed to complete his mission. And so in Daniel 9, 20 to 23, as we've studied, Gabriel what? He comes back. And he says, now I'm going to explain what? I'm going to explain the Moray. And he gives the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And after he gives the prophecy of the 70 weeks, notice Daniel 10, verse 1. The first verse after the prophecy of the 70 weeks, it says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, which is around the year 536, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And notice, and he understood the message and had understanding of the mare. Did Daniel now understand the mare? Is there something in the prophecy of the 70 weeks that is useful in explaining the 2300 days? Do you see the connection or not? Do this, did the 70 week prophecy help did the 70 week prophecy help Daniel understand the mare? that has to do with the 2300 days. Absolutely. Because you notice that before the prophecy of the 70 weeks, Daniel says, I don't understand. Gabriel says, I have come to give you understanding. Gabriel gives the prophecy of the 70 weeks, and after he gives the prophecy of the 70 weeks, Daniel says, I understand. So the 70 weeks explained the 2300 day prophecy. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Very, very important. Now, Let's notice Daniel chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out and have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Understand the moray. And that was the, what, is, uh, what does Gabriel uh, explain to Daniel? The 70 weeks. So are the 70 weeks instrumental in explaining the 2300 days? There's no way you can get around it. Now notice what verse 24 says. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. And then there are six things. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up, a better translation would be to bring to an end vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Six things that were going to happen during the period of the 70-week prophecy. Once again, I need to underline this because it's so important. Does the prophecy of the 70 weeks have anything to do with understanding the prophecy of the 2300 days? Is there a connection and a link, yes or no? Absolutely. You can't get out of it. Because very, very clearly, Daniel does not understand. Gabriel explains the 70-week prophecy. Then Daniel says, now I understand. Now, let me tell you something about that word determined that is used here. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now, that word determined, this is the only time that, that it appears in the Old Testament. It's uh, what theologians call a hax legomenon. In other words, it appears only once in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, it's translated in different ways, determined, marked out, etc., but the basic meaning of the word shafak is actually to cut off, to cut. Even though it's not used in other places of the Old Testament, it is used in the Mishnah. You know what the Mishnah is? It's a collection of Jewish traditions. And uh, it's very ancient. And the word shafak is used in the Mishnah. Let me explain how it's used there. Because it does help to understand how the Jews use terms 
even though it doesn't appear in the Bible, we know how they use these particular words. The word shathak is used for cutting parts off of animals in the sacrificial service. It's used for cutting off the foreskin in circumcision. It's used to cut the wick of a lamp. It's used to cut ore out of a mountain. And it's also used to cut or divide the Bible into two parts. A verse that you're studying, divide it into two parts. In other words, the basic meaning of the word shathak is to cut off. Now, of course, the big question is, when it says in Daniel 9 and verse 24, 70 weeks are cut off for your people in your city. The question is, cut off from where? Let me ask you this. When something is cut off, must it be cut off from something? Absolutely. For example, if you're going to cut a branch off of a tree, do you have to have a tree to cut the branch off of? Of course. So the 70 weeks are cut off. Where do you suppose the 70 weeks would be cut off from? They must be cut off from where? From the prophecy of the 2300 days. You see, the prophecy of the 2300 days is the longer portion of the prophecy. The 70 weeks, as we're going to study in our next two lectures, is the first portion that is cut off from the longer 2300 day period. Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. That's what the basic word means. It means to cut off. In other words, the 70 weeks are cut off from the longer prophecy of the 2,300 days. Now basically what I'm saying is that in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2, Daniel is motivated to pray because of the desolation of Jerusalem. Whereas later on in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25, Gabriel comes back and he says, listen, your prayer has been answered. Jerusalem will be restored after the 70 years. There will be a command to restore and to build Jerusalem at the end of the 70 weeks. But the 70 weeks are the first portion of the 2300-day prophecy. Now listen to what I'm going to say because it's very, very important. 70 weeks is symbolic language, isn't it? Because we're not talking about literal weeks, are we? We're talking about symbolic weeks. In other words, 70 weeks, and each week has how many days? Each week has seven days. Are we talking about literal uh, days, or are we talking about symbolic days? We're talking about symbolic days. You have to apply the year-day principle. And by the way, I know very few scholars who would say that the 70 weeks are to be taken literally, because they know that the 70 weeks are really weeks of years. Even though the text does not say weeks of years, some translations translate weeks of years because they know that the 70-week prophecy is really a prophecy concerning 70 weeks of years. Now, if you multiply 70 times 7, 70 weeks times 7 days, how much do you come up with? You come up with 490. 490 days, right? Because they're 70 weeks. But those days represent what? Those days represent 490 years. Now listen carefully. The real reason why Bible expositors don't want to connect Daniel 8 with Daniel 9, do you know, most scholars refuse to see any connection between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, even though we saw a clear connection. Point after point after point shows that there's a connection between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. But most scholars don't want to connect Daniel 8 and 9, including many Adventist scholars. Do you know the reason why? It's very simple. If you apply the year-day principle to the 70 weeks, which is the first part of the 2300 days, you have to apply the year-day principle to the 2300 days as well. Are you following me or not? And if, and if you do that, if you take the 70 weeks as applying the year-day principle, they're actually weeks, but they represent years. The 2300 days are the longer portion of which the 70 weeks are cut off. You would have to apply the year-day principle also to what? 
to the 2300 days and have mercy. If you did that, you'd have to become a Seventh-day Adventist. According to what we're going to study in the next two lectures, there's no way around it. And that's the reason, the real reason why scholars don't really want to connect Daniel 8 with Daniel 9. They say that they're dealing with two different topics. It's impossible that they're dealing with two different topics. We've already noticed abundant evidence that these two chapters are actually very closely connected. Are you understanding my point? Now, let's examine the six things that were going to be accomplished during the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Do you remember what they are? Finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make re reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. Now let's take these one at a time and show how they are fulfilled during this 70 week period, particularly during the last week of the 70 weeks. Let's deal first of all with finish the transgression. This word transgression is the strongest word in the Old Testament for sin. There are many words for sin in the Old Testament, but this particular Hebrew word is the strongest word. Really, it should be translated rebellion or revolt. In other words, it is a high-handed rebellion against God. And by the way, this is not some indefinite rebellion because in the Hebrew, the word rebellion or the word transgression has the definite article. It is the transgression. This is a specific transgression, a specific rebellion or a specific revolt that will finish during the period of the 70 weeks. Now we're going to find in our study that this really is referring to the constant rebellion of Israel against God, the constant revolt of Israel against God. And Israel could choose to end this rebellion in one of two ways. The first way would be to receive the Messiah and in this way end their constant rebellion against God. The second way that they could do it would be to irrevocably revolt against the Messiah and this would bring the Hebrew theocracy to an end. In other words, everything was determined by an acceptance or rejection of the Messiah. They could choose to continue their revolt, revolt and rebellion against God, or they could accept the Messiah and bring their constant revolt and rebellion to an end. Prophecy, as well as the Gospels, tell us that they chose the second option. And we're going to study this when we deal with the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Now let's go to our second accomplishment, to make an end of sins. Notice it doesn't say to make an end of sinning. It says to make an end of sins. How did Jesus make an end of sins? By bearing them where? By bearing them upon himself on the cross. In fact, let's notice several texts. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us that when Jesus had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He purged our sins. Hebrews 9 and verse 28 says that Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Hebrews 9 and verse 26 tells us that Jesus appeared once at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And finally, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12 tells us about Jesus, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Did Jesus take upon himself the sins of the whole world? He most certainly did. Did he make an end of sin? Not sinning, but of sin by bearing it upon himself. Absolutely. This phrase is also messianic. All of the accomplishments of the 70 weeks were going to be accomplished by the Messiah. You cannot separate the 70 weeks from the Messiah because it's the, it's the story of the Messiah. It's not the story of some antichrist that's going to appear in the future. 
It's speaking about Jesus Christ. Do you think it would be a very serious thing to take a prophecy that applies to Christ and apply it to the Antichrist? A very, very serious matter. Now, in the prophecy of the 70 weeks, we're going to see this. You are going to be amazed at the next two lectures. I can assure you, I, as I prepared, I was amazed myself. Because Scripture is so powerful. It's not because I have some supernatural wisdom. The wisdom is in Scripture. I was amazed at how everything fits together. Now, let's take the third phrase, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Let me ask you, who reconciled man to God? Jesus did. Notice Isaiah chapter 53. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, the word reconciliation is used with regards to Christ. It says there, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled, we were what? Reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being what? Reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What is it that reconciled us to God? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. This phrase is also messianic. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 18 and 19. Once again, the, the idea of reconciliation is connected with the Messiah. It says there, now all things are of God. Who has what? Reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now let's go to our fourth, fourth phrase. To bring in everlasting righteousness. A better translation would be to introduce everlasting righteousness. Do you know what name is given prophetically to Jesus Christ? He is called in Jeremiah 23, verse 6, the Lord our righteousness. Are you acquainted with 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, where it says that John writes these things so that we do not sin? But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the what? The righteous. Did Jesus introduce everlasting righteousness by his life on this earth? He most certainly did. Notice Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11. We're told there about the Messiah. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. So what is he called? The what servant? The righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. This thought is developed repeated times in the New Testament. For example, in Romans 3 and 4, the whole subject is righteousness through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, Jesus Christ is called our righteousness. Did Jesus Christ introduce everlasting righteousness by his coming to this world? He most certainly did. He brought in everlasting righteousness. Now let's go to our fifth phrase. To seal up, a better translation is to bring to an end. We will take a look at this phrase in uh, our topic, not the next one, but the one after. To seal up or to bring to an end vision and prophecy. Now you say, what could this mean, to bring to an end vision and prophecy? Does this have anything to do with the Messiah? The fact is that we're going to deal with this more extensively when we deal with the 70 weeks, but allow me just to make a couple of comments. The 70 weeks actually end in the year 34 AD. And what great event marked the ending of the 70 weeks? We're going to study this. You have to accept it by faith now. Uh, what is the great event that brought the 70 weeks to an end? It was the stoning of Stephen. You see, the 70 weeks, we're going to see they present the baptism of Jesus, his death in the middle of the week, and then at the end, you have the stoning of Stephen, and I'm going to prove to you from the Bible that the stoning of Stephen is the ending date of the 70 weeks, and I'm going to prove it with abundant biblical evidence. Even Adventists who 
You know, I've studied this and wondered about uh, why we end with the stoning of Stephen. You're going to see it very clearly. Do you know that the last prophet who received a vision for literal Israel was whom? Stephen. I'm going to prove to you that Stephen was the last prophet that God sent to the Jewish Sanhedrin. Did Stephen see a vision of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary? He says, I, saw, I see heaven open and the Son of Man at the right hand of God. He's seen this how? In vision. Is this the last vision that God is going give, to give to the literal Hebrew theocracy? Yes, it is. Stephen is the last prophet who gets the last vision for the Jewish nation. When they decide to stone him, vision and prophecy come to an end. Are you understanding me? Now, the important thing is you understand the concept because we're going to go through this with a fine-tooth comb scripturally in our next couple of lectures. Now, let's go to our final phrase. To anoint the most holy. Literally, it says to anoint the holy of holies. Now, this expression can be understood in two different ways. First of all, the expression holy of holies can be understood of a person. It could be understood of Jesus Christ. He is the holy of all of the holy ones. Or it can be understood also as the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, the question is, which of these two translations is the correct one? The fact is, I believe that both of these translations are correct. Both of these concepts are correct. You say, how do you know that? Because when the Hebrew sanctuary was inaugurated, the entire sanctuary was anointed, including the most holy place. And also Aaron the high priest was anointed as well. In other words, the entire sanctuary, including the most holy place, was anointed. And also the high priest, Aaron, was anointed as well. I want you to read Leviticus chapter 8, verses 1 through 12, where you have this original ceremony where the sanctuary and the high priest are anointed as they begin their service in the sanctuary. Let me ask you, when Jesus went to heaven, was he anointed high priest over his people? He most certainly was. Notice Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and verses 32 to 36. We're not going to read it because we don't have the time, but there, very clearly, Peter on the day of Pentecost explains that Jesus Christ was anointed priest and king over his people. I want to read a statement from Acts of the Apostles, page uh, 38. This is a book written by Ellen White where she speaks about when Jesus was inaugurated as our high priest in the holy place of the sanctuary. She says this, The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. In other words, the tongues of fire and the mighty rushing wind was an earthly announcement that Jesus had been inaugurated as the high priest. She continues saying, According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth, and now notice, and was the anointed one over his people. So was Jesus anointed to be the high priest? Absolutely. You want to read an interesting little psalm? Psalm 133 speaks about the anointing of Aaron. I wish we had time to talk about this psalm. It's a real short one. It begins by saying how wonderful it is for brothers, uh, brothers and sisters to live together in harmony or in unity uh, in one accord. And then it speaks about Aaron and the oil being poured over the head of Aaron. And it's dripping down his beard and it's dripping down his garments. And the oil is so abundant that it's dripping down on Mount Zion. You know, that's describing the day of Pentecost. When Jesus Christ was anointed high priest over his people, he received the gift of the Holy Spirit from his Father before he gave it. His Father gave him the gift of the Spirit, and then Jesus poured it out upon his followers on earth. And the Holy Spirit was so abundant that, was, that Jesus was anointed with 
that it actually dripped down into the upper room on Mount Zion where the disciples were gathered together. Now let me ask you, as soon as Daniel chapter 9 comes to an end, does Daniel now understand the Maray? Let's finish by reading Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. What is that referring to? The appointed time was long. Ah, the prophecy of the 2300 days, absolutely. And he what? Understood the message. And in case you didn't understand that part, it says, and had understanding of the mare, of the vision. Does Daniel now understand? He, what led him to understand? How did he understand the mare now? Because Gabriel had explained the prophecy of what? Of the 70 weeks. Thus the 70 weeks are the first portion of what? Of the 2300 day prophecy. If we can know when the 70 weeks begin, we can know when the cleansing of the sanctuary begins 2300 years later. And I can assure you that that date is the year 1844. More specifically, by examining the Hebrew feasts, we can specify the day and the month as well. It is October 22, 1844, when the 2300 days or years come to an end and the process of cleansing the sanctuary begins. We will have a whole lecture on what it means to cleanse the Hebrew sanctuary.